Hey everyone, welcome to the Bodybuilding.com quadcast. We've got four heads, five heads in the room, uh, including the sound guys for everybody's four-headed mu- favorite four-headed muscle. <laughs> uh, I'm your host, Nicholas Coleus Medialis, along with Heather Rectus Femoris Eastman over here. Ooh, Heather Rectus Femoris, yeah. I like that. And then we've got with us Julian Michael Smith, aka the Quad Guy. You're not, you're not one muscle. You're all of them. No, no, yeah, he's yeah, the it. quad, yeah. guy. <laughs> the quad guy. Julian is a bodybuilder, rising social media fitness mind. I guess I, I feel like it's easy to say rising because it looks like you've gone up like a hundred thousand followers on Instagram in the last hours. I've been stalking. Just you. chipping away. Yeah, that's right. Fine. But you're also one of those guys who you just hear about a lot in the gym these days because you ask somebody what they're doing and you find out that you're you're, you're one of those people who's creating and reviving better ways to do things that yeah. people are already doing. Absolutely. Not just creating, but also kind of reviving. It seems like you have an eye to history always For as sure. well. Um, and Julian's been on the bodybuilding.com campus all day today, um, shooting workouts, Snapchat stuff, uh, Facebook Live stuff. So welcome to the podcast. Great I appreciate coming. it. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Um, now, but yeah, as, as I kind of indicated, one reason we are excited to have you on here is because you're not just a bodybuilder, you're kind of a student of bodybuilding history as well. Um, I, we were talking before we were recording about this great video you had about sort of hidden gems in, your, in the yeah. town that you live in growing up. And uh, I was wondering, how long, how long has that been part of what you do? Because you've been bodybuilding for a long time. Yeah. How long is, has history been informing what you do? I guess it's been since like the beginning. Mm-hmm. So I've been lifting for about 15 years, bodybuilding with like like tr- like diet base for about 12. So I've been doing it forever, but the gym that I started at was called the Powerhouse Gym out in Forest Grove, and now it's called The Gym. Mm-hmm. And, uh, original. Mm-hmm. Uh, but <laughs> what's cool one. about that gym was, and that's kind of what sparked this whole thing with me and how I wanted to run my Instagram was, it was very one preacher bench, one squat rack, mm-hmm. one of everything, but it was a very popular gym. So if I went there at the popular time, it was totally all about waiting. And I was a you know 17-year-old kid, so I was waiting in line for everything that I wanted to do. And it just became very apparent that you know I'd look at old school ways to do it. Because back, it just clicked to me, and through all the research that I did, the old school guys didn't have half the stuff that's available now. Right. So you'd see pictures of Tom Platts doing sissy squats with a dumbbell holding onto a bar. Mm-hmm. There's no machine. There's no right. squat rack. There's no anything besides him and a dumbbell. And you could always get your hands on a dumbbell so and it's kind of by necessity not yeah just, you know. yeah like i did like i'd have a time you know as a kid you know i had my st- i had my normal stuff to do and i had to get in i only had a set period of time that i could lift but mm-hmm. i wasn't going to spend you know a fourth of my workout waiting to get on something and i feel like that's what everyone does nowadays right. like oh the squat rack's not open and you see them sitting and playing on their phone right if the squat rack's not open figure something out to do and that's the way that i did it mm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense, though. It's like, but but people are so so they're married to their programs sometimes exactly. too. They go in and think, if I don't do this and this in a specific way, I'm going to screw everything up. It'll yeah. ruin their day. Yeah, and that's the thing that I wanted to like kind of portray or like show everybody that once you find like how the body does things, like a bicep curl is very simple. Right. You lower your arm and you raise it. Are you telling me the only way you can do that exact movement is like at a preacher station? You could, you could like bend over with a dumbbell anywhere in the gym and do a bent over like concentration curl or something like that. Mm-hmm. And if you could find different ways to do that, it just makes the whole thing much more easier. Mm-hmm. Sure, but, but at the same time, you've encountered perfect pieces of equipment, it seems exactly. like. Exactly, and you can't neglect yeah. it. That's mm-hmm. what I think a lot of people come to my page and they go, stick to the basics. Well, that's one video that I posted in that right. day. I did five exercises for that workout, mm-hmm. which included incline barbell press, flat barbell press, Mm. bar uh dumbbell flies and mm. then you go on to something a little more tricky you know something a little more you don't see doesn't mean you don't hit the compound it doesn't mean you don't attack the necessities first mm. 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 yeah i noticed that on your instagram descriptions you have like all this detail on how to do the exercise yeah. and what what came first the chicken or the egg on that one was that because you're doing these kind of different movements in the machine that wasn't necessarily designed for that or yeah. You know, tell me a little bit more about how you kind of developed this very distinctive style that you have, because you do. You don't just post one sentence. It's this yeah. whole paragraph of how to do it correctly and where to feel it. I think that when I first got into the sport, there was no Instagram. There was no Facebook. There was nothing to really give you information besides maybe like I think there was maybe like Flex Magazine and that's about it. Right. And those are pictures. There's no really description. It just says four sets of 10 on squats, four sets right. of six on this. And then it, that was kind of the end of it. But I was always like, man, I'm not feeling it. Why am I not feeling it? And I just thought that when I made my Instagram that I wanted to really make something that could help people because I didn't get a lot of the stuff when I, yeah, you could like 
bring the dumbbell or the dumbbells or barbells down to your chest, press it up. But if you're not feeling it in your chest, you don't just sit there and say, work on form, like dude, tuck your elbows, keep your shoulder blades retracted. As you come up, focus on, you know, pushing your elbows together, not your hands and actually make like the actual, the primary work muscle do the work. And mm-hmm. sometimes it's just a little thing like, Hey, when you're doing back pull with your elbows, not with your hands. And everyone's like, dude, I cannot believe that all you had to do was write that down. And it like clicked for me. And that makes a huge difference because mm-hmm. I didn't have anybody that could help me with that growing up and a big following on my page. I'm pretty sure it's between like, I'm pretty sure it's like 18 to 24 is my largest following, mm-hmm. uh, through like my metrics and everything or my insights. And I just thought like, you know, that's an age where maybe a lot of people are getting into it or they want to like perfect their form or get better. And that's why I wanted to like really break it down. Like, you know, talk to me. There's so much science out there Mm -hmm. and I see so many, uh, you know, there's such good information out there, but it's so science. It's like, okay, if I read this now, I have to read all the definitions of the words that were in that sentence. Dude, man, Mm -hmm. like, just tell me, like if it's written in crayon, tell me how to do it the right way. And that's what needs to click for people. This maybe a little more hard work and a little more you know, basics to it. I don't need the scientific breakdown of what mm-hmm. everything has taken place. Just tell me how to do it right way. And usually the simple way is the best way to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of you when you were 18 to 24, I saw a before and after picture you can, on your Instagram today. You kind of got in the spirit of being in the mm-hmm. bodybuilding.com yeah, yeah, yeah. hallway with just packed yeah, yeah. with hundreds of before and afters. Yeah, me at and the same weight. This is you at 18-ish, 28-ish. I think or- I was, yeah, I think it was like right when I graduated from high school, we were on our senior trip. Same weight, and were you aspiring to be a competitive bodybuilder at that point? At that point, well? I was lifting pretty. But I was night and day, it. like not even the same fucking species. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what was cool about that, and and I think too many people do their diet too much. Tr- their training goes on, and they think that if the scale's not moving, then they're not seeing results. Right. And in that picture, I was 195. Uh, I think it was like 194, 195 somewhere when I graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. And I was 195 in that picture, same height, same weight. Mm -hmm. Uh, But obviously my body composition changed. Mm -hmm. I put on a lot more muscle, but people just think that, I mean, that's basically 12 years, 11 years of straight lifting. Mm -hmm. And if most people heard that, oh, you weigh the same that you weighed in high school, they'd think, oh, what a terrible body. But look at the picture. (laughs) You know, I'd rather change something like that. It's not all about the scale. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. But what what uh, what clicked in there? Like, you, you know, you didn't have that person who was showing you the way Tom Platts did the th- things, the way that you do things. Yeah. Um, wh- when did you kind of hit your stride, do you feel like? Uh, I hit my stride. It was basically looking at, I was, well, I think it was back then, it was like, is it called Kazam? Mm-hmm. It was like illegal downloads. And oh, I just okay, download not the, like not the, the Shaq movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're like Kazam. <laughs> You know about the Shaq no, movie? I know, you're, I like, you're like Space Jam, yeah. great flick, No, no, I, I know Kazam, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's there. where, before YouTube and everything, we were just downloading like old school. I'd download, you know, Pumping Iron. I think right. Total Rebuild was like the 1980 video. Mm-hmm. And you could find small clips of Tom Plass doing that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I really like the idea of the way Tom Plass trained because he was like, he'll be the first one to say, and this is not a, a dog on him at all, he didn't have the best genetics. Right. He didn't look like Arnold. He didn't have that big, huge chest with the broad shoulders and great mm-hmm. arms. He was really known for just one body part. And at a young age, I just thought to myself, you know what? I don't have like a broad shoulders. I'm a a relatively tall guy in regards to bodybuilders. I'm six feet tall, but I don't have huge broad shoulders. I don't have a huge, massive chest, but legs picked up very quickly for me. Mm -hmm. And that's something that kind of gave me hope at an early age. Like, look at this guy. His name's this is Tom Platts. And he almost made an entire, you know, just, just a name for himself based off of one leg, like just, just not one leg, one muscle, you know what I mean? A lot of people are like, you know, I got to have everything. I got to right. be the best of the best of the best. And, you know, I, to be honest, I don't know if I'll ever, when I'm going to get on stage again, mm-hmm. but what I really appre- like, really enjoy and really appreciate more than anything is, is building on the physique that I have. And once you get past the whole, God, I really want to look like, I used to be obsessed with Evan Santapani. He's uh, a great guy. Mm-hmm. You know, when I actually was cheering for him, when him, and uh, Guy Sister Nino mm-hmm. won their classes at, I think it was Nationals a long time ago. I right. think it was 08, 07 or somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, those are the guys that I want to look like. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Sister Nino's a shorter guy, right. but Evan Santapani, big guy, that's what I want to look like. And then you start thinking to yourself, I'm not going to look like that. Right. I don't have the genetics to come close to that. Mm-hmm. But once you can start appreciating yourself, I think that's when you start getting the, like more drive. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You can be really stoked on what you're going to do. A lot of people are like, I had a guy send me a direct message of somebody watching the live from the workout earlier. Mm-hmm. And I think they were talking about 
we were talking about something that was in regards to the workout, but his comment was, well, if I'm skinny and don't have any definition, why would I even try? Like, right. what a horrible mindset. <laughs> like, you're not even going to try? Like, right. you need to scrap that because yeah. what's really cool about every single person is you will never look like me. I'm never going to look like you. We're all never going to look like each other. Right. It's going to be, you're going to be able to build something that is 100% different. You could have similarities, mm -hmm. but your physique's always, no, one's, no one will ever look like you. Sure. That sure. is a really interesting perspective for a bodybuilding yeah. mentality because yeah. bodybuilding is all about getting everyone to line up exactly the same yeah. so right. everyone looks identical and yeah. we can judge all of you and just pick out those little that tiny details yeah. that look a little bit package. different. Yep, exactly. So that's, that but is competitive very cool. competition yeah. is part of what really defines find your early years. Yeah, I thought that's well, all though, I wanted you know? to do, mm -hmm. to be honest. I, I really wanted to get into, I wanted to be competitive. I knew that I, I didn't necessarily have a chance at, uh, like, I didn't really want to do, like, IFBB Pro. Right. Mm -hmm. Being six foot, I would have had to have been, like, two, like sure. 30, 40 on stage mm -hmm. minimum to uh, win my pro card. And it's just not something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just one of those things where, you know, I guess when you get it an early, like I, I used to play a bunch of sports growing up. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from high school, I wasn't playing them in college. I needed something to do. And lifting was super easy. I enjoyed it. It's mm -hmm. pretty simple. You know, if you enjoy something, you're just going to continue doing it. And then when you start seeing more and more progress, that's where I, you know, kind of put more time and energy into it. Sure. And then when you see you're excelling at it, that's when it really, you know, motivates you. Mm -hmm. Now, now you live in Portland, right? Portland, yeah. Well, it's, it's a it's a town I know pretty well, and it's a town where people really they fearlessly experiment with their bodies a yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you do you feel like that a bodybuilder can feel more at home in Portland because of that, or are people on the on the streets that sort of like ooh gross muscle? No, you know what? I don't necessarily. What's funny is for a long time I was kind of thinking that Portland was going to be like the the big Venice Beach, California. Right. It's mm -hmm. like to keep Portland weird. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the naked bike ride, which breaks records right, every sure. year for the most mm -hmm. naked I've people seen it in one spot. Dude, we'll be, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll mm -hmm. be downtown Portland, and all of a sudden, like I think they, last year they had like ten thousand people dress up as Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And you just like walk out of the restaurants <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, like there, it's a sea of Santa Claus right. out there. And you know, in the winter, I think they call it like Santathon or something uh -huh. like that. But you would think that that would be more accepted. Right. But it's honestly not. And I don't think bodybuilding is ever really going to be. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think I'm, I'm like, you know, the mass monster right. 90s bodybuilder mm -hmm. walking around. I think someone, I think it's the veins. You know what I mean? I yeah, think that's what be, it is. Yeah. You can be a built person right. and everyone can look at you and go, well, that guy's in good shape. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have like the veins that I have on my arms, I think a lot of people would go, wow, he's in good shape, you know? Mm -hmm. But when you see the veins, mm -hmm. I think it's just a negative stigma and they think that it has to do with drugs. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone's ever going to be okay with drugs, mm -hmm. you know, the drug use, you know? Hmm. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So you've done some weird exercises in the gym. And specifically, I'm thinking of that kind of goofy frog leg to like you're underneath the Smith machine doing the vertical press. Oh, yeah. And last I didn't time. I think you were going to go with that one. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Like, where is, which one is it? That was the one where I did kind of the Scooby Doo like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and last time you and I talked, we talked about how you don't really take credit for having invented any of these. You yeah. say, you claim that you've kind of seen other people doing them at the gym. So yeah. my question is, have you ever tried one of these kind of off the wall exercises and it just did not go well? It went completely sideways on you and. You know what? I think there's always like the trial and error. There's always a way to make it work. I'm not going to go do something. It's not, it's not like, it's like, I'm not going to go step in the ring with like Conor McGregor and be like, I think I could do it. No, dude. Just with Floyd, Med Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, just you know, Floyd, you know, <laughs> exactly. that's, you know, no like, brainer. You know what I mean? But, uh, but stuff like that, I'm probably never going to put myself in a situation because if I'm trying something that I'm already questioning, I better like damn well know that I'm going to be able to do it. Okay. Like the, mm -hmm. it's like I told you earlier, like, when you understand the mechanics of what's taking place, you know, you can't really get hurt. It might be a little funky, but if the movement, if, if you're lying on the ground and doing like that, the, the wide stance press on the squat, uh, the Smith machine, like you're talking about, that's exactly what like a barbell, like wide stance squat is, oh, yeah. but you're upside down. You've just And everyone's like, it. oh my God, you know, what are you doing? It's like, mm -hmm. well, it's the same exercise. Somebody was on the squat rack and I was like, I got stuff to do today and let's do this, you know? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it does seem like the, you, you you don't look down on any piece of equipment in the gym. Is that no. just is that part of yeah your historical mindset? Maybe you're like yeah. everything has its use. Like the Smith yeah. machine, for example, 
everybody's favorite thing to hate on. Every str- every strength coach, I feel like, on T Nation, on bodybuilding.com comes on yeah. and says, don't use the Smith machine for anything except calf raises. Yeah. But you're like, you know, there's there's a real use here. Yeah, you know what? You can't beat the basics, but what's really cool about this, I'll tell you right now, the Smith machine is incredible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I use it in every one of my leg workouts. And the reason why I use my Smith machine in every one of the leg workouts is because you there's just simply stuff that you cannot do with a barbell with a Smith machine. Like, I do actually this one where I call it the ultimate ass to grass squat. And what I do is I put my feet out and I squat down and touch my butt to the ground. Mm-hmm. This Think about that for a second. Heels elevated on the dumbbell? Is that no, 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 no. Oh, okay. so, feet, out, feet out wide? So you'll have your okay. feet far out in front of you. It's oh, going to be okay. glute dominant. Okay. But you stretch so far down that your butt touches the floor. Hmm. Hmm. Can you do that with a barbell? You I fall mean, back. You fall backwards. If you come down stuff. to do that, you fall back. And it's stuff like that where you get your compounds out of the way. You get your you get your squats. You get your, your stiff leg deads. You get your normal leg stuff done. But... You can isolate your quads in a different mm-hmm. way. Like if you were to, like my sissy squats on the Smith machine, where my you know driving down with your knees and it's right. a quad dominant exercise. You know you can't do a lot of stuff like that with mm-hmm. total balance. But you get in something like that, it's it's almost as if it was made for that. Mm-hmm. If you put a sticker on the side of the Smith machine and said four sissy squats, right. and it was on there, people would go, "Well, there's a sissy squat machine." Right. Mm-hmm. It's just the <laughs> lack of what it says that makes you think mm-hmm. otherwise. If like a barbell curl or like a, a Smith machine or not a Smith machine, like a like a, cur- a curl machine or mm-hmm. something like that, said something different, like shrug machine, and it showed you how to do a shrug right. on a like a preacher curl machine, it would look normal. But mm-hmm. everyone just says, well, that's not what the picture says. Right. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. So right. all these machines are just mislabeled. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, yeah. That, that, who, I mean, that's, yeah, who that's screwed the pooch on that? That's part of it, though. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Someone's yeah, losing like, a um, job. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's yeah, your Chris niche right Gethin, there. Chris who does a bunch of videos for us, he just wanders around the gym and he looks at something and the name of the machine means nothing to yeah. him. And he's done yeah. all these different things. So, yeah, like... The shrug machine, he'll do deadlifts on the shrug machine. Then he yeah. goes over <laughs> he goes over to the assisted pull-up he's machine doing, and does tricep extensions, tricep extensions on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it just it's like he, he looks so free in the gym, you but know. But that's a, that's a really cool mindset. I right. like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I I I feel like I got maybe a little uh little bit of the ADD going on. I get mm-hmm. too bored doing the same stuff. I want to switch things up all the time. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. When people dog on you for, well, why don't you just do bench? Well, you know, you work that in, you know, that is right. one of the things, but what are you honestly going to say to somebody that does something weird when it works for them? Mm-hmm. I don't know if people think I do that for absolutely no reason, just right. to like be cool and have people scrutinize you. But you know, I do that because it works. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember we did a we did a history of the squat video a few years ago on the site that I um I had to end up writing and doing some voiceover and did a ton of research into the history of the squat. I remember discovering all this all this fascinating stuff and all these you know, incredible characters back there like Paul Anderson, Tom Platts, yeah. and just going deep into that rabbit hole. Yeah, learning about not only that, the Steinborn squat and the bent press yeah. and all these great lifts. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of that, a lot of that inf- information is lost too. Like it's mm-hmm. it's easy to be influenced by the characters, but sometimes the techniques that these guys actually followed, you it's miss it. totally lost. Well, look to at like hoist machines nowadays. Mm-hmm. They do some of the movement for you. Right. They actually move mm-hmm. to make you do the, the correct form. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, where's the, te- I mean, you know what I'm right. saying? Mm-hmm. Like the actual thing will move to make you do it correctly. Like a dumbbell, you got to figure it out on your own. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why I always tell people your barbell and your, your dumbbells should be, you know, a majority of your workout. And if you want to do some other machine and stuff in there as well, anybody who follows uh, the workouts on my site or anything like that, they know that's exactly what I do. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, there's different tempos, you know, in regards to negatives, there's different uh, paces in regards to how long you're going to hold at the bottom of an exercise mm-hmm. or contract at the top. Uh, or you can go high reps, low reps, whatever it is. But, you know, you could have variations in there. But the compound basic exercises need to be done. Sure. And, mm-hmm. yeah, but you, bring, you mentioned the negative as well, which is something that you worked yeah. on, Heather, with an article about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, sort of uh, yeah, it's the, the forgotten half of the movement when yeah. people are focused on moving weight. Like, yeah. this is what I'm trying to do is hit a number to feel good about myself. Well, people right? don't – they think about it like this. Like, you're bench pressing. People think that, well, if you didn't get the bench press up, the, the, that rep didn't count. Right. But what you don't realize is the negative is what's tearing the muscle and right. breaking it down for growth. Mm-hmm. So I take more time with the negative to do that. I know there's a lot of people out there that says like too slow is counterproductive. But for me, going extra slow like that helps my muscle do more work. So if I don't have a good mind-muscle connection in my chest mm-hmm. and I have to do a four-second negative to contract the weight up and feel it contract, that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, but it's, and the concentrics on, on your reps don't look like they're – 
super slow. It's not like you're just tiptoeing no, through the whole yeah. thing. It's, regular, it's almost yeah. like you just turn the rep on its head. Yeah, you know exactly. Like you're actually thinking of the lowering as the rep. Is that exactly. is that was that where the yeah, one two yeah. three is? I actually uh, a buddy of mine I was talking to him a while ago, and we were spitting some information back and forth, and he was just like, the way that I think about a lot of people just think about getting the exercise up. They don't really think about. It's like usually like when you go through like a sport or something, let's say like a quarterback in football, mm-hmm. you're going to snap the ball, you're going to take two steps back, three steps back, whatever, you're going to pivot, you're going to fake, then you're going to break everything down before you do it. Right. But a lot of people, you need to do stuff like that in your exercises. When I squat or bench or whatever I do, I, I break it down. You know, That was actually something that Tom Platts did in one of his vlogs. You, you, you get the weight off, you mentally think, take your breath, get your breath in, you're nice and tight, your core, everything, You know, your spine's aligned, your shoulders are attracted back. Okay, now we're doing the negative. All I care about is the negative right now. I'm not thinking about how hard the positive is going to be. We're thinking about getting a good negative right now. And then you're going to do a good pause and then you go up. And then that, when you break it down like that, to like, it almost turns one simple exercise into 10 different parts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when you put that much focus on it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And we have a strength coach who writes first name John Russin, who's been on a podcast um, guest in the past, has a cool approach to that with the deadlift that he's written about for us, where it's like, yeah, you actually just you think about the lowering. This is the rep, and then up, yep. and this is the rep, and up. But the deadlift, it seems like the ultimate movement for no, it only counts if you get it off the ground. It's yeah, the yeah. deadlift, right? Yeah. But no, yeah. you're thinking an eccentric deadlift instead. Yeah. And um, yeah, you, you talked about that in the article that you did with Heather as mm-hmm. well. Um, yeah, eight centric. Or eight seconds. Eight seconds. Eight yeah. second eccentric. Say that five times. Yeah. <laughs> well, so um, also one thing before we get into that, what uh, a lot of people, it's kind of like what you mentioned, they they rush the positive, mm-hmm. and they don't put too much emphasis on the negative. And what people don't see in a lot of my videos, and this is almost, I would say, ninety percent of the time, you ever see people get on their last rep on bench? Right. What do they do? They rack it. Right. You should be doing the negative on that last one. Mm-hmm. So all, all if you're especially if you have a lifting partner, you take advantage of stuff like that. Your body's at a full vulnerable position to finally take on mm-hmm. that weight. It's completely fatigued, and you're robbing it of that last negative mm-hmm. rep. So when I do my squats, mm-hmm. you know you'll see it very often that if I leave it in my videos, that I get buried under it. I put mm-hmm. the bars up enough that if I, that I can fail, bring it down for one last, knowing I won't be able to get back up. And set it down on the pins. Okay, and so you just get the last negative. Set it down yep. on there. Yeah, I like yeah that. anything yeah. where you could do that. I mean, think right. about like a, like, like a preacher a, curl or like something. A bicep curl. Yeah, that's yeah, the you first never, thing I thought of. You, you never, never do a bicep here. curl where you come up. Mm-hmm. You and always you end don't, here. Yeah, mm-hmm. but why don't ever? Nobody ends on bench. Nobody right. ends down on squats. Nobody, you know, you end All down Anderson on deadlift. Did. Yeah, there Anderson, you go. Anderson squat from the pins, right? Yeah, just turning the movement entirely on its head. Exactly. Okay, I like that. Huh. All right. So you're known as the quad guy. Are your other muscles? Jealous because the quads get all the attention. You know, I think my quads aren't necessarily, I I think they're impressive, but I think it's impressive because of the stigma of guys don't train legs. There's a lot of guys out there that have much more impressive legs than me, but I also feel like uh, it's the separation and the, when I'm completely dieted down, all four heads of my quads are completely striated up, which is very, uh, I think it's more rare, but that's something that I I work very hard on. I do uh, usually at the end of my quad workouts when I'm dieting down for a show, Mm -hmm. I'll do like 30 second contractions on like one, like standing up and squeezing a quad as hard as I can, just locking it up. And that's what gives you those cross striations, Mm -hmm. which is something normally when people are done with their workout, they leave. They're done. You know, when you imagine getting done with an arm workout and then squeezing your bicep into a ball as mm-hmm. hard as you can for 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that makes a mm-hmm. very big difference. And was this something that you started doing just as posing practice for show or or was the was this actually part of your routine and your training mindset? So I wish I had the guy's name and I wish we could reference him in this if we could look it up, but there's an old bodybuilder from like, he's actually considered like, cause it's actually before the first clinical study of steroids cause he w- he's actually considered one of the first natural bodybuilders ever. Mm-hmm. But this guy built his physique off of flexing. Right. Hmm. Think about that for a second. And he's like, his neck looks like it's insane. I'm trying to think uh, what the guy's name is, but there's only like it. maybe five or six pictures total of him. What, what decade are we talking? I'm pretty sure it's like 1890s. Okay, yeah, because may- there, there, are, there are a lot of old muscle control manuals. I mean, like, this that is, was a serious component of people's This training. is like yeah. prior to mustache, you know, right. singlet. This is okay. like, this guy actually, I think he's like, it looks like he has like, like fishing line and something covering up his package. It's uh-huh. like he, I mean, it's really strange. Pre like Sandow and everything. Pre Sandow, pre wow. everything. But pre he's Sandow. like super built. Okay. And I remember okay. reading articles on his training and he contracted body weight 
the mm-hmm. entire time. That's all sure. he did. Ne- never really lifted weights. Mm-hmm. What he would do is squeeze his muscles as hard as he could for mm-hmm. periods of time. And he looked very, very impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a major part of how Sandow trained as well because yeah. he'd have to go out, he'd go up on stage and he would isolate muscles, explain how they work to people and the women yeah. would faint mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, his, his teacher was, um, what's his name, Attila. Yes. And he's in the history of the squat video. That might be who we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. But there's all, yeah, picture, just one or two photos and then yeah. like find a painting, it, don't you of worry. course. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, super cool, though. I think uh, that's like the history aspect. Uh-huh. You know, you yeah. dive into plats and you just think to yourself, what would guys look like in the 90s or the 1890s? Mm-hmm. You're like, holy crap, they're still huge. Right. What were they doing back then? You know, and you start seeing like, oh, they didn't really have anything. You know, they weren't not much dumbbells. There was no bench press. There was mm-hmm. nothing like that. But why is that guy so jacked? Why right. is he so big? And it's, you know. That worked for him. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. nowadays, if I went into a gym and just started squeezing my body as hard as possible, people would be like, that dude is the biggest idiot ever. But that's not how this whole thing gyms. started. <laughs> not at all, Jim. Touche, touche. Um, now, but yeah, is there like a black book of training out there of, of these guys that, we, that you can refer to? Or do you, you, know what? Do you have your black book somewhere? You know what? I've actually, someone said that I should do something like that. And it's pretty interesting because those guys... You know, it's like the golden era and even prior to the golden era, the people that started this whole thing, they were the test subjects, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's what I really like about bodybuilding. Nowadays, all you hear is, what's 65? You got to do 65% of your one rep max right. and you got to progressive to overload mm-hmm. or you're not going to mm-hmm. do it. It's like, sure. what about when Tom Platts used to squat, you know, 50 right. reps? And people are going to make an argument for, oh, well, the guy was on, you know, drugs or something like right. that, you know, which he was very open about and everything. But have you ever done, I, I've done the 60 rep squats. I've mm-hmm. done 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. <laughs> and it was one of the gnarliest leg pumps I've ever done right. in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things where you can't do that every workout. Mm-hmm. You know, I actually, by the time I was done with that workout, I actually got the flu. It mm-hmm. broke my immune system down right. because of how hard in I hit In the middle it. of the third set. <laughs> yeah, it was like, whoa, man, this, is, this is rough. But, yeah. you know, you activate muscle fibers that your body's never, ever experienced done before. Mm-hmm. And people don't think like that. All they think about is 8 to 12 reps no matter what. And they'll be the first ones to say, well, how come I'm plateauing? Look at right. your training, man. Mm-hmm. You haven't done anything different mm-hmm. for the past three years. I, I'm surprised you don't look, you know, less, you know, mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. But those guys also, they grew up in a different era nutritionally as yeah. well. Like how they ate yeah. was different. And then it feels like in the 80s, 80s just screwed up everybody nutritionally. Yeah. Right? And it sounds like uh, yes. reading about you, you had some horrible preps yeah, that oh, were based yeah. on the bodybuilding status quo of how to prep oh, as yeah, well, man. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like all the protein, none of the fats, yeah, feel was, like shit. I was, <laughs> yeah. So you read it. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you read my exact words. Cool. Uh, so yeah. I don't remember if the words feel like shit were in there, but yeah, I was yeah. reading, reading they, I was like, they, this guy felt like shit. Yes. wanted to die, something <laughs> yeah. like that. But there was a, I remember that was my prep going into my first show when I was 19. And I was doing two hours of stair stepper. Mm-hmm. I was on zero carbs for I got car I got fifty grams of carbs every four or five days, no fats, and four hundred grams of protein. And it was fish, <laughs> four hundred grams of protein, and that and that was eating it. Full of fish. fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was actually you have a tank. It was like two, it was boxes of tilapia. Single handedly depleted the yeah. Pacific Ocean. Yeah, exactly. So guess what fish I never want to eat again? Yeah, yeah. this is why you live in Portland. <laughs> exactly. Close to the ocean. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. So uh, so actually, when that was done. I had such bad damage like metabolically mm-hmm. that I actually gained like 45 pounds of weight mm-hmm. in two weeks. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I was doing uh, I was doing construction work at the time mm-hmm. and my feet were so swollen I couldn't even lace up my work boots. Mm. It was, I mean, that's some scary crap, man. Right. And a lot of people think like that. It's like, why would I ever need that amount of protein? And it's just because of the people that you listen to. Right. And mm-hmm. he finally breaks up down. You mentioned Lane, Lane Norton earlier. Mm-hmm. I've read almost everything that that guy uh, talks about. And, you know, everyone's got their own take on training. Everyone's got their own take on this. But when it comes down to nutrition, I feel like nutrition's pretty pretty proven. You know what I mean? You could look at some guy and say, well, you need to do progressive overload for, you know, uh, your workouts or you're never going to see any progress. But that guy's seeing progress. So I think training is one of those things where uh, if you're training correctly and your intensity is up, even if you're not focusing on like a set progressive overload, mm-hmm. you could still see plenty of progress. Because I know a lot of people that are bigger than me. Right. And they don't do progressive overload, right. and they're natural bodybuilders, and they look insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it comes to nutrition, it's pretty cut and dry. And back then, like you said, everyone was doing that like super high protein. I didn't even know the fats that I got was the fat that was in the fish, and I right. think there's not much at not all. Not much. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling so, you. Yeah. you know, that's such an important part of a diet in general, just for your mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You don't have fats. I mean, this is going to sound really sad, and it was a really – upsetting time in my life because I was like, I really want to bodybuild. I want to really want to keep this going. But I was literally 
eating and sleeping because I was so hungry to get to my next meal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was back when, you know, I was really focused on making sure you eat every three hours. And it wasn't every two and a half hours. It wasn't every two hours or 45 minutes. It was every three hours. I'd sit there and look at my watch and think, (laughs) Why? And <laughs> three hours. Okay, now I'm going to eat. You know, time my <laughs> microwave up perfectly that yeah. when it goes oh, off, it's geez. been three hours. Yeah. So that's so how I was. Same thing. You've always been this dialed in is what you're trying to do. Yeah, us. so yeah, I don't mess around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but have you learned uh, nutritional techniques from the, the guy, the great bodybuilders of the past as well? Have you looked into yeah, that? You yeah, you know what I like about those guys? It was... Uh, <sighs> What was it? Intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't, you hear about Tom, uh, not Tom Platts, Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about it awesome. Uh, He makes an excellent point of this whole thing. He'll sit there and say, you know, I didn't eat like the way people did nowadays. People Mm -hmm. eat nowadays to like scarf. You know what I mean? Like you worked really hard to get on stage. Why do you have to eat seven like tubs of Hagen dolls when you're Mm -hmm. done? Why do you have to do all that? You know what I mean? Arnold and those guys back in the old days, Arnold would sit there and say, well, back then, you know, I used to have, you know, two or three medium steaks, two or three medium steaks. Mm -hmm. That might be a lot of steaks, but what if that steak was six ounces? What if it was eight ounces? What if it was seven? That stuff people would fret nowadays. And I admired the, I'd rather have a much happier lifestyle and eat intuitively Mm -hmm. than weigh every single thing out like this entire time i've been here i made conscious decisions you know what i mean i i went out after the photo the video shoots and everything from training uh the other day i went out and had uh three rolls Mm -hmm. uh like uh sushi rolls Mm -hmm. and then i had uh three or four of the hand rolls which is a lot of food but you know what i did i knew that i had a big portion of fat there a big portion of protein and a big portion of carbs so later in the day i didn't eat normally Mm -hmm. you know eat a little more cleaner you know have salads with chicken have something that's a little less carbs a little less fat no you blew so much of it earlier Mm -hmm. and that's where people fall off they just think it's 24 7 eating and that's why people are 50 pounds overweight or they just fall apart if they just go off their macros i don't have my scale i can't go out to eat you know i used to miss thanksgiving and christmas dinners with my family Mm -hmm. times that you can't get back you'd skip them yeah i'd sit there and eat Mm -hmm. out of a tupperware Mm -hmm. while my parents you would cook awesome meals for the family and i would skip it because I thought that you couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And I see too many people. It's, what's really weird is it's still happening. There's still people out there that are like, flexible yeah. dieting doesn't work. Right. Oh, my gosh. Right. Like, how, what do you need to see, man? Mm-hmm. Like, it just works. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like it works for you because you just have those, you have the idea of macros programmed into you from all your experience? It takes work, though? man. Mm-hmm. I will say that because uh, I actually have uh, like an Excel spreadsheet on my phone. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has my proteins, carbs, and my fats. And when I eat something and I can track it, let's say, you know, you eat a bag of potato chips or, mm-hmm. uh, you eat like one of the, what are those little honey bunches of oats things right, or sure. like little bars or something, anything that's got a scan on the back, mm-hmm. find out how much you ate and just type it into your thing and then track what you're doing. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I want to hit my carbs, fats, and protein, which I know what those are. And at the end of the day, you know, tally everything up right. and then try to hit that. Mm-hmm. That's being, that's making a conscious effort. Is your body going to fret over you going, you know, 10 grams over? Mm-hmm. No. Is it going right. to fret if you're going 20, 20, 30 grams below protein? Maybe a little bit, but on the scheme of things, would you rather have a more balanced life that you're happy with? Or would you rather be mm-hmm. restricted to being buried in your phone and being, you know, nothing's worse than being depressed because you ate three ounces of fish instead of four. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Right. And I used to be like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Much better life now. Mm. So it's like half intuitive, but also careful tracking and yeah. just kind of finding that right balance. It, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, there's a lot of learning that goes into flexible dieting. You have to figure out, I have people ask all the time, what are macros? Mm-hmm. First of all, everybody who's listening to this, it's a simple Google search away. Right. I don't know why people, I don't, I've never seen somebody doing something and go, well, what's this? Google it. Mm-hmm. My dad tells me to Google stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, well, how is that possible? Right. Like kids nowadays, if you got a question about something, Google it. You can find studies year old. on What's, every, what, are, oh, what yeah. are my macros, yeah, daddy? Yeah, flip, open that, you know, <laughs> flip open that phone. What am I talking about on that one? <laughs> flip that shit flip right open. Yeah. Uh. Turn on that N64 and let's do this. That's right. Just Go over to Kazam, download your macros. Yeah, yeah. You just know? get it right. <laughs> but yeah, man, I, unfortunately, there's a little bit to learn prior. Mm-hmm. I'll tell everybody that I think once you learn uh, what your general macros are and you have a concept of flexible dieting, you can live a much better lifestyle and uh, enjoy bodybuilding much more. Because when I got done with that first show, I thought I wasn't going to do it anymore. Sure. Mm-hmm. And do you feel like going full scale and way is necessary just to kind of grasp the, the concept even oh, yeah. initially? Yeah, that's well, something that's, I've been kind of toying around with is, is, is that necessary yeah. to go that? When I go home, like there's a big difference because when you're getting ready for a show, 
you're going to present yourself on stage. You right. better look awesome. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to lose eight pounds for a photo shoot and you're not supposed to be stage ready where your cheekbones are sticking out, right. you'd be a little more lax on stuff. Mm-hmm. But you should track if you're trying to hit your goal. And when you get a good grasp on everything, you can be a little more lenient. You know what I mean? When I'm at home and I have a scale, there's no reason to not do that. But if you're out at a restaurant and you're eating dinner with your friends and family for someone's birthday, dude, just eyeball six ounces of steak. Right. You know, you can look up all this stuff. I was just in, uh, I was at the Jack Johnson concert in Bend mm-hmm. uh, just, this, just over the weekend. Uh, got home and flew here. Uh, but we were out at a Mexican restaurant and I was like, I want to keep, you know, there's places where you can go that you could be a little more conscious of your goals. Like, okay, we're going to go out to eat. This is a burger joint and that's all they have. Whoa. Okay. You know, I don't know what the hell they're cooking that stuff. And I don't know what kind of fries you're going to be the person eating a burger that could probably have like, you know, 80, 20% right. lean beef or whatever, but you could always go to, so I chose, I was like, how about we go get Mexican food? I suggested that to the group. Let's get some Mexican food. That sounds bomb. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to be able to track my food pretty good and no one's going to know that I'm dieting. So we went to the Mexican <laughs> restaurant. I ordered their like, was it the, the flank steak? Mm-hmm. Uh, they tell you the portion that's in it. And then you just get a couple of those little tortillas and you put some veggies in it. I looked all that stuff up, put it into my little uh, Excel spreadsheet and tracked my meal and no one even knew. Mm-hmm. And it's stuff like that. I think, I think people think to themselves like, well, I can't even go out. Dude, you can go out anywhere. Mm-hmm. I'll be heading down to the river. Uh, my girlfriend's son and I just cruised down to the river the other day, just him and I. I stopped off at 7-Eleven. I grabbed two Rice Krispie treats and a bag of jerky. Mm-hmm. I threw that stuff in my app, and that's what I ate as a snack when I was down there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not the ideal food to eat. Right. You know, I wouldn't be eating Rice Krispie treats every single day, mm-hmm. all day. But if you want to just get something in to keep you on track while you're gone for three or four hours, then you come back and then you can start doing more stuff that you can prepare on yourself. I like that. Yeah. Jer- jerky, I feel like, is one of the great it's amazing. shit. Jerky yeah. and rice string cheese. Rice crispy treats. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all I took away yeah. from that. Just the rice crispy yeah. treats. Yeah. yeah. String cheese. In a and nutshell, nuts, all you know? I eat is yeah. rice crispy treats. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. Rice crispy That's body. It. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, one other thing I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about is about um, squatting with with boards under your heels, right? Yeah. This is this is something that has a, has a reputation of being like, oh, you only have to elevate your heels because you have poor ankle mobility yeah. anymore, right? Yeah. But you you um, do squats, different types of squats, different elevations. You know, everything from a little bit to full on two boards. Yeah. Um, how much of a difference do you feel like exploring that has made? Because that's totally an old school training. Approach. What's really yeah. funny about that is. People can say whatever they want, but it hits the muscle differently. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like uh, when you have your heels elevated, you can actually create more depth. So that person is now stimulating more. They're getting a longer range of motion. So you can dog somebody for having uh, poor ankle mobility, right. but with that board under them, they're squatting lower than you. And their squat is better. It's, and it's better. better form so what squat, are you going right? to say? Mm-hmm. That's. I mean, I do, trust me, I do a lot of stupid stuff in the gym, right. but it's not stupid. It's stupid to the outside world. Why would you do that? Works for me. Mm-hmm. It works for me. I mean, you what? It's like I said earlier. What can you honestly say when it works? That's why when I hear people dog on like uh, flexible dieting or right. or talk a little, you know, oh, it's ridiculous that people are doing that, but it works. Mm-hmm. Should you be eating pop tarts every day for your carbs? No. Mm-hmm. But can you do something like that and lose weight? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. If you ha- if your body needs three thousand calories to gain weight, and you eat twenty nine hundred calories of snack pack pudding every day, you will lose weight. Is it healthy? No, but you'll lose weight. <laughs> right. And people don't realize stuff like that. They think that it's this way or the highway. And in regards to the squatting thing, every time you change your stance, every time you change your heel or toe elevation, it's going to hit the muscle differently. And I think that's a win. Mm-hmm. That you need to have all of them in your yeah. arsenal. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I find it, I have still people, I had a guy write me the other day and he goes, dude, he goes, I've been following you since you had 20. He literally screenshot, and this was what was really cool. He had screenshotted something from, I think it was when I had like 2,900 followers mm-hmm. a long time ago. Right. That was almost wow. three, four years ago. And uh, he goes, in the time frame that you've been doing this, you have done like, I don't think I've ever seen you fully like redo the same exercise. Mm-hmm because you're always changing. You're always doing something a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. I'll reference stuff from a couple of weeks back so they can look back and go, okay, it is different. And I think that's, uh, you know, if it's different, it's going to hit a little bit differently, right. you know, mm-hmm. ever so slightly, but it will. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and not only will it maybe keep you growing and keep you progressing, but keep you from just getting burned out and getting repetitive stress, repetitive yeah. stress. Like I yeah. see people doing, so the, the people who always seem like they're hurt are 
my friends who are power lifters. Oh, yeah. Because they're doing the same damn four or five things over and over and yeah. over again. And just gradually stuff starts wearing and off. And exactly. probably with incorrect form. But yeah. that's just because no one's yeah. perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and then the way that I train right now is I do a, kind of like a heavy week. And then like not necessarily a deload week. But it's a lot of time under tension and high reps. So book ending them one after another. Yeah. So I would go, I would go, so I would do something where like my normal split would be like either a five by five, everything is hit with a five by five workout or an eight, six, four, four. So you're dipping down into the low reps. Mm -hmm. And then the following week when I hit chest again, it's going to be four sets of eight with four second negatives. Uh, And then you would go on to four, uh, four sets of 20 reps for cable fly. So you would hit the different, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, different muscle fibers, different rep ranges. So you're kind of given that four to six rep range of break and you're now you're hitting it with some of those high reps and then next week it's going to be ready for the high reps again back to the low reps cool i like that that's an interesting approach yeah. because yeah we have a lot of people on the site these days saying you know do them in phases do yeah. four to six weeks of one four to six weeks of the other and and people have great success with yeah. that but alternating them like that seems like you could you could carry that on for quite a while that's what i want and, and that's what's really cool about it. uh even arnold talks about it in one of his old uh one of these videos where i think it's the blueprint for mass or something like that i think i don't know who they did that with well, that's uh, on our side i think is it yeah i think so i think you're right yeah uh but he he talked about something really cool he's just like it's the whole shock thing mm-hmm. your body you do the bench press over and over and over you're going to get to the gym and your body's going to go i know what you're doing mm-hmm. and i'm ready for it right but if you go in there and you do 100 pound dumbbells and then you drop set to 95s then 90 then 80 then 85 then 75 then you know all the way down to 50s your body didn't know that was coming right. and it's going to shock the hell out of it. And that's essentially what I'm doing every other week. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going from heavy uh, compound reps, you know, the compound sets and compound reps and, you know, compound exercises. And then you're going to the next week where you're going high reps, shocking it. But then you might go back to those low reps. And then the next week you might be doing supersets or giant sets. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing those high reps, which it might think you're doing the high reps again, you're doing something completely different or drop sets or something like that. So your body is always guessing. And in re- like in a nutshell, isn't that kind of what progressive overload is? Sure. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. progressively doing something to overload the muscle. And if your body never knows what the hell you're going to do, mm-hmm. how's it going to get used to it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. so now when you, 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 you publish all of your websites or all of your workouts on your website, yeah. do you have them written down before you go into the gym or is that something you write down after? And so a like, lot this of is people, what I did. It was yeah. awesome. What's funny is a lot of people ask, they go, what the hell do you do for work that you're able to do like all this? Because a lot of people post stuff up on Instagram and it's kind of, biceps and then it's them doing a bicep exercise it's very short you mentioned that earlier i break stuff down so i have a full-time job outside of this and i usually train about seven or six or so in the morning and i have all my captions all my videos and everything filmed before i even leave the gym so when i go to work throughout the day all i have to do is upload them and they're done so people think i'm like you know dicking around on my phone while i'm at work it's like dude i take like go take a pee (laughs) Mm-hmm. Upload my stuff, and it's up there for you guys to look at, and I'm going back to work. Mm-hmm. So it's not some 24-7 thing. It's it's all done before most people get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And you've, are, are your workouts planned out in your mind the second you stepped in, into the gym? No, and that's kind of the concept where I don't want my actual exercises that I do. I might walk in there and say, I want to put a little more emphasis on my chest today, right. or upper chest, I mean. Mm-hmm. Or I might want to put a little more emphasis on the long head of my tricep or short head of my tricep or something like that. But usually when I go into the gym, it's the sets and reps – uh, that are completely mapped out. Mm-hmm. So I could say, I'm going to do four sets of eight today. I'm going to do an eight, six, four, four, uh, exercise. I'm going to do three sets of 40 mm-hmm. reps mm-hmm. Uh, and then do a compound set. Mm-hmm. And I have those reps. Let's say I walk in there and I really want to do skull crushers. Everybody's over there doing those. All right, we're doing double arm overhead right. with those reps. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I hit those reps for whatever I want to do them on. Mm-hmm. And that's where the variety can come in and be plugged in wherever you want. That's cool. Yeah, that seems like that could that's yeah. a sustainable approach. For yeah. as precise as you are, that's a very kind of go with the flow way yeah. of approaching it. Yeah, because I think the most important combo. part is the reps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People think that, you know, the exercise for I'm doing those exercises to benefit myself. Mm-hmm. What if the guy looking at the video has an incredible chest and you don't need to do something that's going to help you work on your mind muscle connection because yours is great. Right. You don't need to do it. Mm-hmm. But when I do everything that I do at the gym, that's to benefit myself, but those rep ranges are what can help you. So if you don't like, you know, the Smith machine sissy squats with your knees over the toes, don't do it, but apply those reps for something else. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And still try to feel it. Like there's, you're, it seems like you're chasing the feeling that mind muscle oh, yeah. connection is so central to what it's you're doing. More, uh, there's actually people out there that say that it's not a thing. Mm-hmm. And what just, people? 
I, you know what? I've heard of a few people. people. Yeah, <laughs> people who yeah. are hurt well, if I find them. Just kidding. But yeah, it's funny because I've actually heard a lot of people say that it's a myth. And I don't know if that's some ploy to like discredit somebody. But right. even if the mind-muscle connection is not a scientifically proven thing, mm-hmm. I think that it's 100% relevant in bodybuilding because – I can't tell you how many times I've done an exercise and not felt it in the primary work muscle. Bench pressing and you don't feel your chest contracting, but your your front delts or your triceps are burning. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. you don't have a good mind muscle connection. Right. Mm-hmm. Your chest should be working on bench. If you're squ- if you're doing uh, leg extensions and you're feeling like God like God forbid like feeling in your arms or something like that, that's supposed to be for your quads. Right. You don't have a good mind muscle connection, mm-hmm. and that's what people don't get. Sure. Yeah. I feel like that's one thing that that working here and and talking to people on the podcast has taught me as well is like the mind muscle connection is kind of the it's the great export from bodybuilding to the rest of the training world mm-hmm. to say like you want to know what proper form is. Proper form is feeling it in the right place and being able yeah. to control yourself. Yeah. Otherwise. You have no control over the movement, and you're just begging to get injured at some point yeah. or another. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've actually been uh, no, I don't want to say scrutinized, but questioned often about like the amount the amount of volume I do in my workouts. Like some people say, like some my legs uh, go on for about maybe like an hour and a half, maybe mm-hmm. two hours sometimes. But it's not like I'm doing an hour and a half to two hours of quads. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm doing four or so exercises for quads, three or so exercises for hamstrings, and two exercises for glutes. Mm-hmm. It's not like I'm doing 16 exercises for quads. Mm-hmm. I'm breaking up each muscle. And that's the same thing with arms. You know, people mm-hmm. are like, oh man, you hit arms for an hour and a half. Yeah, I did biceps, triceps, and I did my forearms, and I did grip training. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I just killed my biceps for, right. you know, an hour mm-hmm. and a half. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So it's all about kind of what works best for you as well. Mm-hmm. And when, when you're training, um, when you're training your legs, do you lead with squats fairly early in the routine or is that, or do you pre-exhaust and no, it's actually really rare that I squat first. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of my squatting at the end. Uh, uh, I think it's just because to me, the squats are going to be the same. If I'm shooting for six to eight reps, let's say we're going pretty heavy and we're trying to get like a lower rep range. I would rather hit those three exercises in when I'm fatigued and not, and I don't have to do as much weight, then start with a lot of weight to land in those rep ranges. And I think that's a big thing that most people have a problem with. And that's based off of ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want to do the heaviest, the movement where you can move the most amount of weight when you're so tired, you can't even come close. Mm -hmm. Did all end workouts with two plates for as many reps as I can or something Mm -hmm. like that. People will look at you and go, man, how how are you able to, you know, get the legs that you have Mm -hmm. when you don't use that much weight? Mm. I'm failing on the rep ranges that I need. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if I have to bench 135 to make my chest grow, I'd rather do that than 315. You're not right. going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. You can limit your injuries and you see more results. Sure. Yeah. I feel like that's something I've heard a lot more on our site re- recently from people like Evan Santapani as well, saying like making light weights heavy is yeah. something to be said for that. Even though he's still benching 315, yeah. he could bench way more. Yeah. But yeah, really being able to control that weight and making it's, making light weights heavy is just a good philosophy. It's not powerlifting. Right. You know, if you want to be the best powerlifter in the world, then that's the opposite mindset. Mm-hmm. You're not, you shouldn't be listening to me. Right. I should be listening to you. Mm-hmm. Powerlifting is a different ballgame. But if you want to stimulate the muscle and look like a bodybuilder and do the bodybuilding type stuff, it's the mind muscle connection and, and, and making lighter weight heavier. Mm. Do you, do you feel like, um, the, the attention that you've gotten and the, and the, you know, the people reaching out to you saying, Oh, I followed you for all this long and, and watching those numbers go up. Does that make you want to compete more in the future or less, or just like, I'm you stable in where I'm at. You know, I'm happy with what I'm doing because I really like helping people mm-hmm. and bodybuilding competitions are one of the most selfish thing you could do. Mm-hmm. And I mean that in a super <laughs> nice way because I got I was a competitive bodybuilder that got into this whole thing, and I'm definitely not done competing. But I've seen marriages fail. Mm-hmm. I've seen you know people leave you know each other. You know dating. You, you know you get to a doing too much competitions. It puts stress on the, the right. family, the relationship. See, I'm out. This is what I want to do, and that's totally fine for people that want to do that. It's just not my cup of tea. You know, I compete. I've only done five shows. Mm-hmm. I did two, uh, one show, uh, two shows my first year, two shows my second year, and then I did the Natural Ohio and then the nat- or the Natural uh, Washington Ironman, and then I did the Natural Ohio. So that's six shows total in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, most pr- competitive bodybuilders by the time they're thirty will have probably triple that. Right. You know what I mean? Local shows to qualify for USA's didn't win it. They do the same requalify, requalify, then they right. get their pro card, and that's a lot of like competition. And you could even maybe make the argument that maybe you just don't have the drive to Julian do like drive to do it, Julian. Well, maybe I don't. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's okay with me because I know that the the teaching people and helping people on Instagram is actually 
really fun. And when it comes down to like life and what you should be doing, uh, I mean, that's why you're never going to hear me like talk poorly about CrossFit. You never right. hear me talk poorly about powerlifting. Bodybuilding is not the only way you can do it. And mm-hmm. I don't care if you like throwing rocks in a lake, whatever makes you super happy. <laughs> I do. I'm he com- does. We're he, going after this. Yeah. You and me. <laughs> throwing go, rocks. I have a five year old and a two year old. And yeah. Tonight, yeah. it's actually on the schedule. Super some oddly rocks satisfying. Rocks in the lake. Yeah, we'll head down to the river and <laughs> awesome. like, case, uh, my girlfriend's son and I will be like, just blow our arms out, like, <laughs> see who can hit the log first with the rock. It's just like, that's my thing. But uh, you, you make a good point, though. Even the best prep yeah. is still brutal. Right? It is. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, you're not going to. It's all consuming. It it's is. just going to completely. And you know what? It's super hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you look, it, and it's the, do you feel like shit? Yes. Good. Mm-hmm. And that's the mindset. If you're, because when I was getting ready for the Ohio, uh, I remember waking up and being like, kind of like woozy, probably for like three weeks in a row, three or four weeks in a row. I didn't have any fat on the bottom of my feet and it was super sore to do like legs. Like you'd be like squatting and I'd be like, man, like it's like my bone is touching the ground, my heels. It's like, there's right. no fat, there's no nothing. And your joints are all sore all the time. And it's like, it's, it's super, it's just taxing. It's you know? a vicious, nasty sport and we yeah. love it. Oh, I, remember that, I remember way. the first yeah, yeah, time yeah. I heard that was that, yeah, backstage at the Olympia, guys are limping because they have no fat under the mm-hmm. soles of their feet. Yeah. And that blew my mind. I thought I, I didn't know somebody could get that lean. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's literally like the the whole island concept. Or they're concept collapsing, everywhere. and you know they're so dehydrated, and yeah. just mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it's an insane sport, but it feels like what you did is rather than getting swept up in that current that everyone else was in, you kind of did those few shows, took a step back, and said, well, how do I want to approach this? a different way. And I love that it's not about lifting the heaviest weight possible. You actually looked at it from a very pragmatic standpoint of how can I make my muscles grow? What's the easiest way? And I like that because it feels like people want to go with, well, how much weight can I lift? Which is, you know, you know, how hard can I go? And you're like, how easy can I go? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, it's funny because most people who have the, I got to lift as much weight as possible. I don't think a lot of those guys get on stage. Mm-hmm. It's who's impressing the girl at five o'clock, you know, after work at the gym. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Those are the people that are trying to really break records at the gym. But the people that are like, you know, there might be some strong bodybuilders out there, but a lot of the guys that I follow, you know, you know, follow, know, and do this whole thing kind of lift more similar to me. You might, you know, do some impressive lifts every now and again, but I know a lot of, I mean, it's just like you say, it's like, you do that every single week. That's pretty taxing on your body. And when you start getting leaner and leaner and leaner, you're just more, you know, you're leaving yourself open to like a bad injury. And I tell people this all the time. Uh, bodybuilding is one injury away from never doing it again. Mm-hmm. And I want to do this as long as I can. And imagine blowing out your, you know, your pec right. or your tricep. I blew my tricep out powerlifting. Mm-hmm. I actually ruptured the vein in my tricep, mm. and they, they referred- Not the muscle, the vein. The vein. Oof. I bared down so hard, they, pump right they, remind, they said it was similar to like a hose getting like too much pressure, and it just bubbled and popped. The whole inside of my arm was full of blood, oh, and it was internal bleeding. Wow. So they just snipped the sides of the vein and reattached right. it. Right. Uh-huh. And that was the one time that I've been injured in the gym, mm-hmm. and outside of that, that's really, really, that's when I really started- slowing everything down. And that was probably when I was about, I'd say 20 years old. Okay. So you have heard the siren call of other styles of lifting along the way. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, well, I always tell people, I'm like the strongest I've ever been was when I was like 19 or 20. And that's prior to me hurting myself. I used to, you know, I used to work out at this old gym called Nelson's Nautilus, Mm -hmm. uh, out in, I think it was Oregon city, uh, and like right outside of Portland, Portland area. And I mean, this was a place that when it would like rain, Mm -hmm. the water would just, it was the basement gym and the water would roll in under the door, like by the hundred pound dumbbells. It was just like dingy, like (laughs) super dingy, but you just had that like kind of underground Dorian Yates style training. And, you know, I was doing like, you know, five and a half plates for four or five reps Mm -hmm. at 20 years old. I couldn't even touch that now. Right. But it's, Mm -hmm. you know, a good thing Mm -hmm. because I've seen more growth out of my body doing half that weight. Mm -hmm. It's almost like early injuries are a good yeah. thing to have happen to if you can have if a you good early errors. Yeah. yeah. If yeah, you, you, you want to be a lifelong athlete. Yeah. Exactly. If you can have an injury that doesn't really hurt you, but it opens you up. Like one time when I was about 18 years old, I locked my legs out on leg press and both my legs quickly hyperextended, but I got them back instead of like bending all the way right. down. 
And I remember the pain that I had in that. And I was like really like limpy for probably like a week. Mm -hmm. And I've never done that again. That's why I always cringe when I see those videos on uh, like uh, YouTube and stuff. Oh, those guys, they lock their legs out, out and their freaking legs bend in half and Oof. their toes touch there. What are you there. doing watching that? Don't watch that. They get tagged in that crap <laughs> all the time. They'll tag me and they go, and leg day today? No way, dude. Not that we're wishing <laughs> injuries on anyone, but a nice little minor injury. Yeah, yeah. Really Just like set a little, you on the right yeah. path. A teaching moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks for coming and talking with us. Yeah, man. you bet, man. Um, what What else is next for you? So, what's next? You know, I uh, just kind of want to keep doing this. You know, I uh, I really like what I'm doing. I like getting the these opportunities like this, and it's pretty funny because if you diet down a certain way, mm. it's really and I don't mean this in a negative way, but it, it's actually pretty unappealing to like the masses of the world. People right. need to realize bodybuilding. The people that love the super veined crazy vascular look is so tiny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very tiny even in the fitness world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I was dieting down for my show this last year, Men's Health approached me for some uh, online you know, footage and stuff. Sure, I remember seeing but that. But it was two months prior to the shoot and I was dieting for a show and I was getting closer to my shoot and I had dropped probably six pounds or so in between talking to them. Mm -hmm. And they contacted me and they were like, just letting you know, you're literally getting too lean. We can't shoot you right now uh, because you're not our market. Mm. You're now not our market anymore. And I backed out of my show mm -hmm. and I got maybe like two or three pounds back on, filled out, face filled out a little bit right. more, looked a little more, you know, healthy and normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it appeared, you know, it was a better appearance for what they wanted. And when I'm overly dieting and stuff like mm -hmm. that, it takes you out of those things. Right. I want people to say like, you guys and Optimum contacted me and they say, you know, we want to do some work with you. And that was like maybe a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. I was able to lose, you know, seven pounds to get in shape. Mm -hmm. I want to stay in that cusp and be happy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to battle constant stuff with my own mind where it's like, I got to get to 220. No, I want to be 205. No more than 205 ever again. Mm -hmm. So that way, if I need to diet down to, I'm like 199, 198 right now, then that's a really good, you know, way for photo shoots and stuff like mm -hmm. that. If I want to get tighter, it's easier. But all I need is about, you know, a month and a half, two months to get in shape and ready to go. A lot of people are like, I need months, right? months on months to get ready for this because I'm 30 pounds above. And I don't want to kill myself either for it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Smart. Well, you, um, you are on Instagram at... Smith.Julian. Okay. Where Facebook, else? Facebook, uh, Julian Michael Smith. Mm -hmm. And then my site's just thequadguy.com. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very right. cool site. Well, uh, Julian Michael Smith, thanks so much for coming and talking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.